Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we are going to dive right in, get started, um, because there's a lot to cover and we are together for an hour. So um, let me just get my notes up. Okay, wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for this session, which is an Arts Administrator's Guide to Working with the DOE. We are very excited to have you all here. Um, my name is Kinsey Keck. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman with brown hair. It's up in a high ponytail bun today, and I have long uh, brown bangs as well. I'm wearing a green comfy uh, long sleeve shirt and I'm sitting in my kitchen. So behind me, you can see some artwork, uh, a Texas sign and um, some white walls behind that. I'm also the programming and membership manager for the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. For those of you who don't know, the Roundtable is a grassroots service organization that works to improve and advance the state of arts education through professional development workshops, advocacy, um, and online resources and platforms that connect you all, our arts education field. Although we are currently meeting online, on Zoom, the Roundtable would like to acknowledge that we work and live on unceded lands. Manhattan, or the place that is also widely known as New York City, exists on the contemporary and ancestral homelands of the Canarsi, Munsi Lenape, and Wappinger people. These sovereign nations and communities are still thriving here and we continue to occupy their lands. We would like to give a moment of respect to them, as well as to the Black and immigrant communities which have helped build the city that we know today. As we recognize that all of our pasts, presents, and futures are intertwined, we would like to take a moment to uplift um, a handful of contemporary Indigenous arts organizations that we can all support and learn from. So I'm just going to share some links in the chat. I encourage you to save those, um, get familiar with those organizations and any other ones that are in your orbit, in your network, in your area. Um, learn about them, support them however you can, especially with donations if you can. And do feel free to share and uplift other organizations in the chat that you would like to um, highlight with those who are present on today's call. Thank you. So if you're having any trouble with Zoom uh, throughout today's call, just please send me a private message, Kinsey Keck, I'm here to help. This is a Zoom meeting, so please do keep yourself on mute unless you're the person speaking so we can all hear clearly. Um, I encourage you to use the chat to connect with other folks on the call. We will also have a brief Q&A at the end of this session. Um, you can put your questions in the chat, but our presenters will give you um, some more specific instructions on sharing your questions a little bit later in the session. I also want to note that this call does include closed captioning. To activate captions, you can click a button on your toolbar. It might say live transcript or captions. Um, it may also be in that more dot, dot, dot button that's on your toolbar and you can select, can select show subtitles there. And lastly, I wanna share that this session is being recorded. We will make that recording available to you and to everyone who registered for this session. It will probably be in about a week or a week and a half. I will send you an email with that and any other resources that we share on this call. And I believe that is it for me. Um, it is now my very sincere pleasure to turn it over to our two facilitators today. They are both roundtable board members, um, <laughs> which is wonderful. We're so excited to welcome them. Please join me in welcoming Phil Alexander. Phil is, an arts and art, is the Arts and Education Director for Brooklyn Arts Council. And Keith Kaminsky. Keith is the Deputy Director for Strategic Operations at Arts Connection. Welcome, Phil and Keith. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hi, I'm Phil uh, with the Brooklyn Arts Council. My pronouns are he and they, and uh, very excited to be uh, joining you all today for this session. Uh, and um, I'm going to go to my colleague, Keith. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Keith. I use, also use he and they pronouns. I'm with Arts Connection and also a board member of the Roundtable. Excited to be with you all today. Uh, Great. And so, yeah, so this is where we are. Uh, this is an arts administrator's guide. So we, uh, this is our focus today is on uh, from the perspective of the arts administrator. So working with the DOE from a teaching artist, there's a lot of overlaps there, but there's some issues with um, 
uh, uh, with working with the DOE that are a little different. So, um, and so I'll just re quickly review our overview for the morning. Uh, so we're gonna do, we've done our introductions. We have an icebreaker coming up. We'll review the aims for the day and the topics, and we will have some uh, opportunity for Q and A. Uh, so uh, icebreaker question, do you wanna uh, go forward with that, Keith? Sure, so we're gonna use Mentimeter. Uh, we're gonna put a link in the chat. And our icebreaker question is, what words come to mind when you hear the phrase working with the NYC Department of Education? So uh, please click the link that Kinsey just sent. Um, we'll give you some time to add your thoughts and then later we'll look at the results in a word cloud format. Um, something else to mention for this session is that it's gonna be pretty talking heavy. Um, because we have a lot of information that we want to share. So prior to the session, um, the roundtable collected questions and topics that folks wanted us to cover. We're going to do our best to cover everything, uh, but it means we're going to be talking a lot um, with pretty minimal visuals. So um, we're also going to share a resource document later that hopefully is helpful to you all. OK, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so you can. Um, so we're going to review the Mentimeter in just a minute. So if you have a have some ideas to share, we'll continue with that. Uh, but the the our aims, uh, what Keith and I hope and like and Kim and Kinsey, I think all uh, want to address is actually have some explicit instructions, some how tos uh, for what to do. Um, also provide some context, uh, like uh, working with the New York City public school system is and uh, which as you may know is the largest school system in the country so there's uh, some issues with that um, at the same time we hope that uh, during this experience we can establish a community uh, either um, I, I see some people I recognize so maybe this will strengthen those bonds and maybe build new bonds as a round table so thank you great and so to go over uh, our agenda for the day, we're going to have four main topics that we're going to talk about. Um, I'll be leading us through the section about becoming an approved vendor. Then you're going to hear from Phil about TA hiring, fingerprinting, and purchase orders and invoicing. And then I'll come back on to talk about the culture and structure of DOE schools. Um, so those are the four kind of main sections that we're hoping to cover today. And is now, do we want to, uh, can we share the Mentimeter cl cloud? I'm excited to see some of the responses. Can you give me one moment? Pull that up. And we'll keep the Mentimeter up throughout the session. So if you think about the things you want to add, um, that will continue to populate. And do we have the Jamboard link for questions? Yes, I can put that in the chat right now. Um, so we set up a Jamboard as a way to uh, collect any additional questions that you might have. Um, let me just put that in the chat for you. All right. Yeah, so um, we have the Jamboard um, as a way, to, as one, as one uh, space to collect questions. I uh, encourage you to use that instead of in the chat um, with this many people on our, uh, our call this morning uh that chat if with if a lot of questions keep going that chat can just kind of move a little uh at a fast pace so we feel like the jam board is a place where um you can record that also with the jam board uh you have the option of kind of indicating uh if uh like doing a check box or a check next to someone's other question so if someone has your question you don't need to repeat it or retype it uh but you could list that so um so just looking at um this shared screen um i the biggest word seems to be complicated um opportunity red tape paperwork challenging frustrating, opaque, uh, confusing, not a lot of positive things. Wonderful kids and teachers, I do see that, that's nice. Um, so many online portals, yes, yes, indeed. Um, Keith, any, any things that jumping out uh, to you? 
Uh, no, other than just to add, I feel all of these things. Um, you know, Phil and I have both worked with the NYC DOE for me over 20 years, and I think Phil even longer than that. And so um, collectively, you know, uh, we share this experience with you all. Uh, and part of, you know, why um, we wanted to present this session today is that um, I think the roundtable here is from our community that, you know, there are folks who we're asking for kind of a more introductory session to working with the DOE. And so um, that's what we put our heads together and, um, and hopefully today is, uh, serves that. Um, so Kim, why don't we go back to the slides um, if you don't mind. Um, and we'll move on to the next se section, um, which is gonna be um, me talking about becoming a vendor. Um, so, um, one important thing to note when you're working with the city, when you're working with the DOE, is that there are lots of acronyms. Um, I will do my best to explain each acronym as, as we cover it, but you know, just be prepared that there's a lot of them. Um, so the first stage to become a vendor to working with the city in general um, is that you have to first register with the city. Uh, this is before you can get a contract with the DOE. Um, and so this process is overseen by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, which is called MOCS, M-O-C-S. And you need to create a PIP account, which is the payee information portal. Um, and once that's approved, then you can create a passport account. Uh, and formally, that system was called Bendex. So some of you who may have prior experience with the city when it was called Bendex. It's now it's passport. And Passport stands for Procurement and source, Sourcing Solutions Portal. And in general, the term pr procurement is uh, what the city uses to talk about purchasing of goods and services. Um, and so from there, after you've made your PIP account, then made your Passport account, then you can, uh, you'll have access to be able to review contracting opportunities. So then you can sort of decide what the best opportunities are for you. Um, and uh, the graphic is a map um, from that city website in terms of you know, how they view the roadmap for this initial stage. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So you can continue the process from there in order to become an approved vendor with the New York City Department of Ed if you're interested in providing services to students and teachers in public schools. And the DOE has contracting opportunities that are open to individuals as consultants or to organizations. And overall, the city encourages minority entities to apply for available contracting opportunities. So you can view information on the available opportunities on the vendor info hub. We've included the link to that site on and the contact info for the vendor hotline on the resource page that we'll share later on in the session. Uh, so typically, arts and cultural organizations contract with the DOE through the MTAC system, another acronym, which is the Multiple Task Award Contract. And this type of contract allows you to provide more than one specific service, such as a few different programs or models. And your offerings are available to all public schools in the city. Um, securing an MTAC contract is a lengthy, involved process but ultimately it's the only way to provide services in schools on an ongoing, regular basis. So first you prepare and submit your application, which includes proposing the types of services you wanna provide and detailed unit costs for each type of service. The DOE reviews your proposal and typically negotiates um, with you during the process, um, both negotiating about what you offer and the uh, unit costs that you're requesting. Um, so personally, one pro tip I guess I would recommend is that uh, in submitting your MTAC, uh, the initial proposal of your unit costs, costs should be slightly higher than you're willing to accept to give yourself a little bit of room to negotiate down, just knowing that typically the DOE is going to uh, try to negotiate with you. So if you build in a little room for yourself at the beginning, it'll be maybe a little bit less painful later. Um, after that stage, the Panel for Educational Policy, uh, they're a body that's convened. I think we'll just give Keith a second. Looks like he froze. 
um, I'll step in for a second, just mentioning about the MTAC process. Um, I went through the MTAC negotiation about four or five years ago. It, was, it, it, it happened to be ex very drawn out at that time because they were changing the system a little bit. And um, I think there were some personnel changes and um, there was definitely uh, an issue with, um, with um, uh, arguing, arguing our um, rates down. And so it was something where it's, comp you know, in terms of if I'd known how long it was, I would never have given our current rates in terms of uh, our payment and things that I would have um, advanced that. So um, did we lose Keith? Should I just keep going on? I think so. Uh, it looks okay. like Oh, let's see. I think he's back. Sorry about that, folks. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, Zoom was gone. Um, uh, sorry for that pause. Um, should I continue? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I was talking about the, the current contract term is five years, and the DOE has within the contract itself the option to extend for three more years. And um, a shout out for the Roundtable's MTAC working group. So the Roundtable has a MTAC working group that meets monthly, and that um, can be a way for folks who are going through this process to get some peer support. So um, if you're working on an MTAC, if you don't know where to begin, that could potentially be a good place um, to begin. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, so as folks who are interested in arts and culture in public schools, the DOE's Office of Arts and Special Projects, which is OASP are some important folks to know. And OASP maintains a website called the ACES Guide. ACES stands for Arts and Cultural Education Services. And that lists all of the organizations with MTAC contracts for arts education services. And it includes descriptions of the programs and services they offer. They also hold an annual ACES Fair event where organizations have the opportunity to table and principals and school admin can come and learn about organizations and their offerings. So currently these opportunities are only open to um, folks with registered MTAC contracts. Um, so that's the end of our first of the four kind of main topic areas. I'd love to toss it to Phil who will discuss teaching artists hiring, fingerprinting and the purchase order and invoicing process. Uh, thanks Keith. Um, yeah, so fingerprinting is uh, we have Another acronym, PETS, P-E-T-S, Personal Eligibility Tracking System. Uh, that's a screenshot from uh, the, that portal on the website. I loved the comment in the Mentimeter, so many portals. Yeah, so many portals. Do they talk to each other properly? Of course not. Or the, anyway, uh, next slide, please. So just to walk you through the process. So the personnel, so PET system, that's the administration side. That's that's connected to the vendor portal uh, that Keith mentioned. So we have the vendor portal, we've got PETS. So PETS is just about employee and eligibility. And we're uh, and so within that system, you nom you hire someone and you nominate them and you have to have their uh, email address and their social security number. And so that's that's on the admin side, and then on the individual teaching artist or or in, uh, inside is what's called the applicant gateway. We have these lit. <laughs> Annalisa, I uh, it's I hear you. Pets is frustrating. Yes. Um, yeah, and it's also like one of a very outdated portal. It was like developed maybe 10, 12, 15 years ago, and it, I don't feel like it's been updated. Um, and uh, yeah, so but so the applicant gateway is a little more recent. It's a it's got a slightly better um, interface, um, but it's it's supposed to be it's supposed to be applicant gateway is like the individual complement to the pet system. So uh, so that's where uh, that's and so with with the applicant gateway, each individual and anybody can be anyone can be listed within that contract. Um, so. Uh, so it's not you can list teaching artists and you can list uh, any you can list administrators. Uh, that's that's all within the, within the pet system. That's fine. Um, and then when it comes to actually um, ha getting approval and fingerprinting, that uh, that used to be handled in one location only, which was um, on Livingston Street in in Brooklyn. 
Uh, but now they uh, sub the DOE and other city agencies, and they, I think in the in state agencies also work with this uh, company called Identico. And this started a few, I think just a few years, like either right before or right after the start of the pandemic. Um, but so anyway, that system is set up to, um, uh, to provide more accessibility uh, for more, more sites uh, to do that. And so within the um, applicant gateway process, there's a, there's a, a system of uh, filling in different forms and questionnaires, and then and also gives you information in terms of how to uh, uh, find a, a, a site uh, near you as, and then set up an appointment for that. I build the fee, um, for uh, fingerprinting is somewhere around 115, 125. Uh, Keith, do you know that number off the top? It, 110. Okay, yeah. Uh, just thanks to math. But, um, yeah, so that's something. So that's a fee. Um, I highly encourage all arts administrators and organizations to um, to pay that fee for the teaching artists and their employees. That's uh, that, uh, in my opinion, should be a cost that's absorbed by the arts organization as much as possible. Um, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so. Um, and now, so that's so that's that's the personnel side of thing. Oh, just a one one thing about personnel. There was one question about. I remember seeing in the pre-chat there was a question about hiring college students uh, for summer internships and whether they needed to go through pets. If they're going into schools, um, any any employee of yours, uh, whether they're an intern or a fellow or a full-time staff person, uh, should be. Uh, should go through the uh, um, pets and hiring process that they would everyone would meet the um, uh, uh, applicant gateway as well. All right, purchase order and invoicing. So I put here the three main steps and the three main uh, topics. So there's there's the the brother and sister or sibling team of the work order and the purchase order. And again, this is something where it's the it's the Kind of binary or dichotomy or two sides of the system uh, working with each other. So the work order is generated by the arts organization, the vendor, or and and this. Um, uh, oh, I didn't know I Identico has locations in New Jersey. Thank you for that comment. Um, so anyway, uh, the work order is generated by the vendor. We're going to look at a sample of that in just a second. Um, and so this is the, and so with this, you have to have both a Vendor number and a contract number, so that they, so they um, are uh, will be looking for that. Um, and then the purchase order is then generated by the school staff uh, at uh, in and some schools have their own finance secretary that kind of handles that, and so they know how to work with the um, um, DOE finance system. And I and I never remember the name of that system. Uh, Keith, do you remember what they're called? The um, financial logging system. That that is the vendor portal, actually. So, um, and there's a link to that in um, the resource doc. And so, um, uh -huh. oh yeah, um, individual schools have a finance system. Galax yeah. Galaxy. Is Galaxy. That. That's what I'm thinking. Thank right. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah, anyway, so, so as a as an outside contractor you wouldn't interact with galaxy that is the no. system that schools use for budgeting and purchasing exactly the, the, another case of where we have these two systems that are from different perspectives that how well they're connected uh i don't know uh all right so we have the purchase order so the purchase when's the purchase order is processed that's supposed to be um considered a, a an encumbrance where the money has been set aside so it's so supposed to um uh be as good as you know as good as uh, uh you know that that if once you get the purchase order you should be all set so in terms of the value of the purchase order um some organizations say okay um we, well you submitted the work order we will not begin the residency until we have the purchase order received so that's something uh so others uh you, you know will will move forward uh without that 
for me, uh, if it's a school that I've worked with that I know is is trustworthy, um, if they say we're submit we're processing the purchase order, I'll go ahead and begin with the residency. But for a new school um, where we're working through, I do kind of say, you know, we can begin the planning, but the, the teaching artist will not be in the school until we, you know, until we have that confirmed. And uh, so it, you know, it's not really it's not meant to be kind of harsh or draconian, just to kind of just make sure that. Uh, we don't, you know, incur any debt uh, with uh, with that. Uh, the last point of the process is the invoicing, uh, which is then just saying, "Hey, you put aside this uh, this funding for us. Uh, please, um, uh, uh, please follow through with that." And with that, um, you may need supporting documents. Generally, the most required one is the uh, uh, class list or attendance list. Uh, let's move into what a work order looks like. And all right, so this is an old, this is a, a, a I think it's a Microsoft Word document uh, where you can fill things out. There is a PDF version of this. I'm not, I haven't been using it because I find it's harder to use and to edit um, in the PDF versus the, I have had schools accept both. So um, the most, it's less about whether it's the most up-to-date form versus that you have all the information. So here, this is the top of the work order. You list your vendor name, the organization where you're located, um, when you're submitting it, uh, then you list the district number for the school, the school name and, and listing. And then of course your contract number and your vendor number has to be listed there. And then, uh, and then an authorized signature from the organization. Usually this is the, uh, if you have a specific contract signatory, uh, this may be your executive director, maybe a head of your department or CFO, uh, something like that. So that's the first page of the work. So remember, that's the work order. That's step number one. Next, pa next page will show us then how you put it in. So there's a short, there's a small space for a pro program description, just kind of uh, where you do an overview of a residency, how long it's gonna be, the topic area, uh, essential elements of this. This is this is kind of uh, as a working contract and you where you can kind of set your terms. Um, I, tr I do this as both a reference point uh, for the future, um, and for future, uh, maybe future programs that I have with the same school or a similar school. Um, but then the next part, oh, and I wanted to point out at the top, be sure to include the, to repeat the date and the contract number. And yeah, yes, um, thanks Keith, I'm, I'll be moving right into the, um, yes, what's been improved, yes. Okay, so as you list things, so you'll see there are four columns at the top, What's the unit? What's the unit cost? How the number of units, and then the total cost. Um, my first boss and mentor at uh, for, uh, when I was working with the DOE was uh, at the uh, with Margie Salvante at the uh, Roundabout Theater, and the way and she said the way to think about this is the DOE is prepared to to purchase pencils. So think about like you're you're selling them pencils. So that so that would be the name of the unit would be a pencil. Uh, how much does it cost? One dollar a pencil. How many units are you giving them? A thousand. So the total cost is going to be a thousand. So it's it's a very um, uh, it's it's a system that likes to work in units. It likes to think in terms of of discrete nouns, something that can be counted. So uh, so that, so when um, so uh, so I when I submit my our um, work orders. The, the most, uh, the, the way I define our value is through the residency hour. Uh, how much does a, how does it, and much does a te an hour for a residency cost? <laughs> Excuse me. And that is, that is uh, an agreement that's part of my contract, that hour contract, that residency hour has been predefined, that amount. That amount has been predefined, and so then I put in that uh, unit cost, and then I put in the number of hours, and I tabu and I tabulate the number of hours in that program description. 
so then I get a total cost. Um, and then uh, what's the unit? So there's a management fee or a program fee, that's one unit. Usually, uh, how many units? That's usually one unit uh, for the whole uh, program. Um, all right, so that's how you, you, yeah, so that's how you list it for the work order. Um, because you, you want to be uh, as consistent with your contract expectation as well as um, what's your name. Um, because then the school staff will use the purchase order to create the work order, which is next. I mean, sorry, but for the, the school staff uses your work order to create their purchase order. So let's go, let's look at what a purchase order looks like. Okay, this is the top. Uh, of an actual work order that I've altered. Um, so this is com this comes from the school. It comes via email um, uh, to whoever is your primary contact in your, uh, is it the vendor? Oh no, I can't remember which portal it is. Um, and so this is so this so at the top it gives all the essential information in terms of your information on the vendor your vendor number. Um, one thing I wanted to point out about the vendor number, uh, our number starts with a zero, but the first three are B R O uh, for Brooklyn. But then it so but but then the first number is a zero. So it's one of those things where like you have to be on look for that. Um, so the, yeah, so then it lists the school um, and then the person who initiated. And then notice, very important, where the invoice goes to, specifically um, the different address, because there are multiple finance uh, uh, offices um, based on the regions and districts of the different schools. Uh, and so this school happens to be in a uh, part of Brooklyn where the um, uh, the email is handled by the payable operations dash R, which stands for Richmond, meaning Staten Island. Um, but so they, uh, so that's the email, and uh, so they want so that's where they want the invoice sent to. Um, and next slide, right? Okay, now here's the listing. Here's the listing on the on the purchase order of what's being provided. So. Usually, this uh, align this should align with what you submitted on your work order. So notice how they have they list the item and how many uh, how many quantity, the price per, and then the amount. So that's uh, so that's something where uh, you want to. That's how you um, outline it there. And that so this is this is essential information right here because your invoice should basically copy this information exactly as it's given. Because the, the way I think about it is the, the, the people who process these, and I've never met any of them, but I think basically they want to say, they want to compare what was the information on the purchase order versus when you submit the invoice. And so they're like, you had a program fee at this amount, uh, at, and these many units, and this total, is that what's on the invoice? Yes, click. If, uh, the performance supplies per class, you had it on, this was what the purchase order says, and this is what your invoice says. Okay, it's so the more consistent, and I mean, use the same exact language. The, the language may not be the same from work order to work order. So in that respect, you should be, she should be conscious about that. All right, and then I think the last slide, it, yes. So yeah. So for when you submit the invoice, whatever your your company invoice system is, as I said, duplicate the terms precisely as described on the purchase order. If it's a particularly um, uh, long period covered by the purchase order, like if it's a whole school year or nine months, or whatever, or uh, and it's a large amount, you know, over twenty thousand. You can definitely submit a, a, per, a an invoice for a partial amount. So you could close. So if it was a twenty thousand award, and you wanted to submit halfway through and submit for ten thousand, uh, you can do that. Um, you would submit. You would need the submitting uh, supporting documents as well. Now, one thing about supporting documents um, uh, in terms of class list, I have had situations where the organization uh, needs to provide that information. I've also had good relationships with one schools, some schools, and they provide that directly to the 
the payment system. So it is so that's that's a part of the um, relationship in terms of how well you get uh, and how well you work with a school, how reliable a school is. And uh, yes, thank you, Marion, for noticing that the the PO number is completely different than the work the, than the uh, work order. So yes, yeah, so, so once that PO number is issued, that's a really important number to keep track of with purchase order. Um, but um, but yes, I mentioned uh, knowing who does the work at the school, the principal or a finance secretary or an AP is very helpful. And so I'm going to transition back to uh, DOE culture with Keith. Great, thank you, Phil. Um, so the last topic that we wanted to cover is around the culture and structure of DOE schools. For those of you that may be newer to working with DOE and NYC public schools, it's always helpful to keep in mind, this is the biggest school system in the country. It is a big beast. Um, it is always confusing. There's always system things that you have to navigate through and acronyms, and people and, um, different portals, right? Um, and each school is really unique. Um, and so as someone from the outside, you may find that you need to adjust your approach to fit with the culture of each individual school. So for example, schools have differences when it comes to their communication preferences or how formal or casual they are or their leadership or management style um, and even which staff member handles different responsibilities. So the person who generates a purchase order might be the principal or assistant principal at one school, and it could be a business manager or the parent coordinator at another school. If, um, if you're looking for demographic info uh, or the name of the school's principal or that type of information, you can view the school's individual website on schools.nyc.gov. Each school has a web page. Um, and some schools have their own external websites that they use in addition to their DOE site. So one of the two sites may have more information or more current information. Um, each school should also have a staff member who's designated as the arts liaison. But again, this person's title can vary. The arts liaison can be a teacher or administrator, and they usually have a role in helping to coordinate partnerships with external um, arts and cultural folks. Um, and then again, the Office of Arts and Special Projects is an important division of the DOE in our field. Uh, Paul Thompson is the executive director, and Audrey Cox is the director of arts partnerships. There are also borough arts directors um, and directors for various creative disciplines. So on the OASP website, you can get familiar with those folks. Um, OASP uh, runs the ACES Fair and maintains the ACES Guide, and they provide grants to schools to work with arts partners to serve a specific population, such as families, students with disabilities or multi-linked groups. Um, so in general, my advice when it comes to working with public schools is to be prepared, to have patience, and to be persistent. Um, and Kim has some breaking news um, in the chat that uh, they will now be known as the Arts Office. So it will no longer be OASP. Um, so that's a very recent change. Um, even uh, before we, we made the slides. So um, we'll make sure to note that and moving forward, they should be known as the Arts Office. Kim always has the breaking news. I try. So I figured I'd let folks know. I just, I think it was just approved yesterday morning. Um, so we wanted to also point out some additional resources that the Roundtable provides. Um, we have um, a couple groups that we call open space, which are open to different types of people. And it really is um, a Zoom meeting that any person, you know, in that group can join um, or support or, or um, to connect with other folks. So there's one that's called the Arts and Education Leaders Group and the Roundtable, you know, uh, defines broadly what a leader is. Um, there's also an open space for teaching artists. There's the MTAC working group that I mentioned. Also a big plug for face-to-face, -face, which is the Roundtable's annual conference. This year, the in-person days will be April 12th and 13th coming up. There's also some uh, virtual components as well. And uh, again, we will be sharing that resource page with you later that has web links and contact info for the different agencies and uh, sites that, that we've mentioned so far.
So why don't we move into some questions? Um, perhaps uh, can we so share? Can we share the Jamboard? I'm I'm looking at the Jamboard right now. Uh, if we can, if we don't, um, yeah. So I'm going to look at. Uh, I'm ready to jump in and look at some. Uh, great. So I'm going to look at the work order PO um, section. Um, so Keith, if you want to look at some of the other questions, um, and we can kind of uh, tag team. So the work order, uh, why do some schools require work orders and some are fine with written outline proposals? Um, the, the people who are um, working with outline, the schools that are accepting outline proposals, not work orders, are somehow can basically doing like an internal conversion from what you've submitted, uh, and they'll have to update that to the purchase order. I would recommend using the work working using the work order format just for clarification from your perspective as an as an arts organization as well as then making it easier for the school to uh, translate that to the purchase uh, purchase order format. Uh, the limits for purchase orders non contracted vem vendors uh, there's a five thousand dollar limit but sometimes it's not an issue. Um, that doesn't, uh, is it because of grant funding or something else? Any insights? Um, yeah, so um, as we mentioned, the Galaxy system is the, is the school budgeting system. I know, I, I've never used it, but I do know from speaking with principals that there are multiple sources of funding that they have access to and that some have, some have limits to it and some don't. So um, yeah, I mean, because schools have access from uh, PTA funds or, uh, other other things that uh, don't have the same kind of that are not are processed uh, differently and not uh, subjected to a, a contract. Um, where can we find the current version of this work order form? I got mine room from one of my partner schools, so there might be one way to get it through the vendor system, um, but I never found it way. The, the easiest way I found it was to work directly with a uh, school project. Uh, why do some schools assign a WO instead of a WR on the purchase order? I think that's uh, that's at like a DOE finance level. I I don't I that may be about it's either about location or district or time of the year or something. But that W that number that purchase order number usually starts uh, with a WO or a WR. Um, so I have no I have no insight to that. Uh, Keith, do you want to? jump in with uh, some responses to some of the other questions? Sure, um, so I'm seeing a couple. I don't know, Keith, did you freeze again? I think so. Okay, all right, I will uh, look at some of the others. The subbing section, recent certified, verified sub teacher at DOE. Now I have another nomination requiring me to go through another background check. Prevents me from working as a sub. It is in OPI camp. Good luck with you. Um, oh, can I be a substitute teacher and an after school teacher? Um, as far as I know, it's that's a kind of a question of you know working for multiple employers. If one of your employers is the DOE as a sub, sub teacher, um, and then uh, an after school uh, with a teaching artist, um, that could be. So, uh, Bill, so I will say. I can jump in there. I am aware of people that do do both where they are a substitute teacher, they have that license and they might work for an organization such as Brooklyn Arts Council at, in an after school capacity. What I would recommend there though is just double checking with your hiring agent or hiring office within the DOE. Um, Cause I know that there can be conflicts of interest but I've mostly heard them pertaining to um, those that are uh, hired as uh, full-time employees within DOE. And I see a note from Caroline in the chat, you can get a moonlighting waiver from the DOE. That's a completely new concept uh, yes. for me. I will say um, I've heard of a few people do that to, to very different, different uh, degrees of difficulty. Uh, Some folks have been able to get that no problem. Some it's taken a bit longer. Um, yeah, so let me see, um, is the MTAC in response to a specific request by DOE or can it be, can it be a proposal the organization puts forth? 
Um, yeah, so the MTAC is a very specific, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a higher level of being a vendor is what it is. So, um, and it's, so uh, it's, it's uh, oh, is it in response to a specific request? Oh, is it a response to a proposal? Yeah, so basically there's, I know that um, you do have to focus, I think there's, there are multiple men, M tax and they do have focus. The, the one that most of the arts ed organizations belong to is, a, is, I think it's something called like arts education services for students or something like that. Uh, there are other MTACs um, that are arts related and there are other MTACs that are not arts related. Um, some are about providing professional development. Uh, some MTACs are about uh, like focusing on literacy. Uh, so, so, the, so the MTAC, um, uh, um, so an MTAC, uh, an individual is not part of an MTAC. An MTAC is an organization. An, M, uh, an MTAC covers, as uh, someone mentioned, um, uh, twenty up to twenty uh, up, contracts up to twenty five thousand, uh, in which you do not need to bid. Uh, so that's that, that's part of the MTAC. So it's a, it's but in the and the level uh, certification you have to go through an MTAC. You have to list your staff. You have to provide an organizational overview. You have to provide an organizational budget as well as expenses. Uh, so it's not something where you would do that. Yeah, and Phil, um, I can expand on that too. And something I just put in the chat if that's helpful. Um, so the MTAC contracting process, to exactly what Phil said, the one that we find folks most commonly do is our 1129, which is art services. It's uh, sort of always open. There is no deadline for it. However, there are stages in which we find folks uh, work with the DOE. That that MTAC contract does enable you to do work up to $25,000 without having to go through that bid process, which essentially means that schools will, uh, they don't have to search out three different people to do a, a bit of a pricing game. Um, However, you are still able to work within that, up to that $25,000 cap as an arts vendor. Uh, I will say from the roundtable perspective, we know becoming an arts vendor is a separate process that's not as labor intensive. And it's something we're working with DCLA and DOE to hopefully produce a separate resource on, um, knowing that in some cases, say for individual teaching artists or for smaller organizations, that might be the right choice. However, with that MTAC contract, really what then it also enables you to do other than bypass the bid process for contracts under $25,000 or up to, um, it enables you to be able to accept contracts of over $25,000 as well. Um, at that rate, given that it is so high, you will still have to go through the bid process. However, um, it just enables you to have access to a higher level contract. We were just informed by two. I see Keith made it back. Welcome back. Oh, I'm back. I'm so sorry, folks. I don't know what's going on with our internet today. Um, Keith, where any, uh, do you see any uh, questions that we haven't addressed um, on the Jamboard that you wanted to weigh in on? Um, I guess there's a couple, uh, there's a question here about how to, um, how to deal with delayed payments. So um, typically, you know, uh, you do your work order, you get the purchase order, you provide the services, and then you invoice for the services. And it can take some time for your organization to actually get paid um, after that time. And so um, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do except really follow up, um, really try and find out um, who the district level person is who's trying to move your uh, move your invoice across and, and find out if they're missing anything, right? So sometimes um, something may be missing and that's why your invoice has been paid out and they're not necessarily gonna be proactive about telling you that. Um, so it, you know, if it's missing a schedule or student rosters or something like that that's required for the invoice to be paid out, um, you, know, you may have to do some, uh, some follow-up in order to find that out. Um, in terms of, I see, a, 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 hoping to answer pet, pets questions. Um, how do you sign up as a vendor with pets? So when you get your, um, when your contract is approved, then um, you work with the pets admin and they will 
uh, create a login for you for the administrator for your organization. So for example, I'm the administrator for Arts, Arts Connection. So I'm the one who I add, add people um, to the system as they come on board and things like that. Um, so that's part of, that comes at the end of your contracting process. Um, uh, we have three admin and three TAs, six staff total, three staff need to be attached to our account and are currently listed with other orgs. So uh, an individual in pets can be listed with multiple organizations as long as they don't have multiple nominations um, open. So if, if, an, if you're trying to nominate an individual as someone who's working with you and they have an open nomination with another organization, that's something that you would need to, to contact pets admin support about that could be a potential reason why you're not able to add them. Um, and then um, on the back end, they should be able to close out that other nomination so that you can proceed with yours. Um, as Phil said, you know, anyone who works on behalf of your organization in schools, whether they're a teaching artist or an administrator, should be in pets and should have eligible status. So you should not have people who um, have ineligible status um, visiting schools um, for your, the protection of your own organization. The website link for pets, um, that is in the resource guide. Um, how do we add non-fingerprinted employees? So the, whoever your pets administrator is for your organization would uh, log in and then um, you add them to your roster. Um, in order to add them to your roster, you need some personal information from that person, their first and last name, their social, their address, their phone number, their um, email address, um, and so forth. How to, how to set up as an administrator in pets. Um, I, you would connect, you would contact pets admin support at schools.nyc.gov. Um, and you would send them your contract and vendor number and let them know that you need a pets admin login. Um, uh, just wanted to uh, uplift um, Caroline's comment. She lists the vendor hotline, uh, both an email uh, vendor hotline at schools on NYC and the email uh, and the phone number. Um, not always helpful, but sometimes they are. Yeah, that's a great summation of a lot of support. Thanks. And Lynn, just to answer your question, no, the, the um, DOE will not issue you a pet um, administrator account unless you have a contract. Right, because part of that part of the pets uh, nomination process is you have to select an individual and you have to select a site that they're working at and, the, and you also have to select the contract that they're working under. So, uh, so within the pet system, it doesn't make up there's no logic and to nominate someone if you don't have a contract so you can't nominate say hey, they, you know they work for our organization No, they have to be. Uh, affiliated with a uh, with a contract number uh, from your organization. Um, one question I noticed was, um, do you contract with the DOE if you don't charge for your services? Um, basically, excuse me. Um, the, uh, from my perspective, the DOE would be um, uh, yeah. So in, in terms of who you're how you're getting in the building or who you're working with or um, volunteering, uh, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of a school by school basis. Um, they would, uh, from, from the DOE's perspective, the contract is, is primarily about money and funding and charges and expenses. So, um, uh, so with that, um, uh, you know, if, you're, if you're not receiving any money, um, the, you know, the DOE doesn't, uh, I don't know if they have a system to kind of hold a, organ a visiting organization accountable. That's kind of, that I would kind of default to the um, particular uh, principle of that building with that, because uh, otherwise, um, yeah, it's then they, they have uh, limited, they don't have any, you know, financial interest in that. Um, let me see. Um, um, I can also address um, Tom's question in the chat. Um, can you do fingerprinting while waiting, waiting for a contract? Unfortunately, I don't think so, but I could be wrong. Um, and primarily because um, you have to have a pets administrator account in order to add employees to your, um, to your contract as folks working under your contract. And then those people go into the applicant gateway and make their fingerprinting appointment and so forth. Um, so I don't think there's a way to 
get fingerprinted unless you, I, I don't think there's a way to get fingerprinted on behalf of an organization unless that organization has a contract. And uh, just again, uh, back to our initial, uh, one of our aims in terms of building community, want to really uh, notice and acknowledge all the advice back and forth from people in the chat. Um, it's, um, AHA Broadway mentioned you have to be persistent, persistent and patient with pets. Another three Ps. Um, months to get things done, answering the same question multiple times. Uh, and then um, uh, Christy also mentioned it took eight months to complete it. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, this may, um, it's um, nothing, you know, things do not turn quickly. One thing I want to recognize uh, in terms of um, the work, you know, that uh, we're, we are, we are, I identify as an arts administrator. I'm someone who works hard to try to get things done. I actually think that there are a lot of people who do work for the DOE who are trying, who are motivated from the right perspective in terms of wanting to support children um, and their learning. Uh, but that uh, there, there are multiple systems that have been developed and uh, have may, may, maybe not have been upgraded or not, uh, but just recognizing uh, that. But also I've heard that the DOE has been dealing with uh, human uh, resource uh, shortages that they don't, uh, <coughs> part of it is, it's not that uh, people don't care, or don't wanna answer it. It's just, they don't have enough, uh, enough people to actually do it and to process it. So it is, so in terms of kind of these delays, um, I think it's both kind of either not having enough people or there's a certain amount of turnover from things like that. I do know that we face that with uh, some of our other contracting and some other agencies. So, and recognize that what we shared today is uh, related to the DOE. Um, you know, a lot of arts organizations get funding from multiple sources such as um, uh, the Department of Health and Mental Health or Parks and Rec. And there, and, and some of these ideas uh, apply to those different agencies and some don't necessarily do. But we wanted to focus on the DOE today because uh, that's the most. Um, Keith, any other comments or notifications before we wrap up? No, just to upload that, you know, Phil and I know some stuff, but also you all know a lot as well. There's a lot that we don't know. And also a lot of these things are constantly changing. And so um, one of the things that I've personally found throughout my career is relationships with colleagues, sharing information, finding information has been really helpful. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think so much of all that I've learned and, uh, and gained from working with esteemed colleagues like Phil, um, who I've known for many years. So. Um, it was super fun for for me to 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 work with Phil on this, and um, I hope this was helpful for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I uh, and I learned thing, you know, and it is a two way learning street. I definitely learned a lot from Keith as well, and so um, yeah. So, but this is and and uh, and as as a long time roundtable member and a board member. I'm really proud to be part of this uh, support system for you all. Um, Kinsey and Kim uh, and the roundtable staff are have great resources. Hope to see you all at face-to-face uh, -face perhaps in a few weeks uh, in person. If, uh, if I don't know you, um, uh, you know, please come up and introduce yourself. I'd love to see you. Thank you both so much, Phil and Keith, for all of this information. I know one hour is of course, not enough time to get through everything, but I really appreciate you putting this into something that we can get through in one hour and answering all these questions. It's so helpful. Uh, folks, I um, just pasted a link in the chat that is uh, the resource sheet that uh, Phil and Keith put together for everyone. I will also send that in a follow-up email with a link to this recording, the slides, um, the chat, all of that good uh, stuff will be put together in an email for you and sent out probably in about a week um, once we have recording ready for you all. So you'll have all of that information there. And yes, I just wanna reiterate uh, the invitation to join us at Face to Face. It is upon us nearly. We're starting on April 3rd with um, some great virtual conference offerings. And then we will be together on April 12th and 13th at Riverside Church in Morningside Heights. So if you'd like to learn more and register, you have the link there in the chat. I also want to um, share again that our MTAC working group will be meeting this coming Monday, uh, 
on the 27th, March 27th from 2 to 3 p.m. You can learn more about it here at the link that I just popped in the chat. But if you would like to be added to the mailing list and the calendar invite, you just need to send me an email. So I'll put my email in there as well. And please also feel free to email myself and us folks at the round table with any other questions you may have. And that will do it. Everyone have a lovely rest of your Thursday and hopefully we will see you soon.